So I'm just getting over man flu, um, and now I'm doing a double session, so I think I'm a bit of a hero today. Um, so I think if you wanted to hear the talk from Orange, and you want to leave now, I think we've locked the doors, is that right? So you have to stick to this session. But, you know, it's AI, it's exciting. Hopefully we'll talk a little bit about some stuff that you might not have heard before. Um, it's not going to be a sales pitch. It's going to be talking about AI and reward and benefits and kind of where we are at the moment and where that's heading. Um, and I guess just before we get started, for those of you who don't know me, so uh, currently Director of Employee Wellbeing at Benefix. I've been in the HR tech space for kind of two decades. Went great at 19, so I look a lot older than I actually am. Um, made a few influencer lists, paid, paid to get my name on a few lists, um, and do a lot around the employee experience space and listed globally as, a, as an expert by, by some people. Um, I've also written a book, which um, you might have seen on LinkedIn, because I did a pretty good job of getting people to share photographs of it. Um, it's called uh, uh, A World of Good, Lessons Around the World Improving the Employee Experience. Um, it was a book looking at how all these different elements of the employee experience are used quite a long time ago in different countries around the world. So lots of the stuff we think about as new and progressive is actually pretty old. You know, it's, kind of, it's not a new idea to treat people well at work and to care for them. That's quite an old concept. Um, lots of people have said some good things about the book. Apparently Arnold Schwarzenegger's got a copy. Whether he's read it or whether he can read, I don't know. Um, one of the most recent reviews on Amazon said uh, a collection of incoherent references. So you can make up your own mind as to whether you are think it's any good or not. Um, and if you want to tweet along and kind of, if I say anything that's quite interesting or there's some slides that you like and you want to kind of share photographs on LinkedIn or Twitter, I'll pick some of you out and send you a copy of the book for free uh, later today. So hopefully that's kind of grounded as to kind of who I am and why I'm here and why you should pay attention to me. Um, you've been using slide already, so those of you who've kind of got it out on your phones, just wanted to get a feel of the room and kind of how um, you currently use AI, if anything in any part of your employee experience. So if you could just take a few moments to just kind of let me know if you think you use AI or if you know you use AI in any part of your employee experience. Can somebody take a photograph of that for me as well, please? Um, so yeah, quite interesting. So you know, three quarters of you say no. Um, I did a talk on AI and well-being at the Reba Wellbeing Congress in the summer, and part of the feedback I had about the talk was lots of HR and all people told me that they don't think past the next kind of six to 12 months. So when I'm talking about development that's happening in the next five years, that's not really a huge concern to most people because the challenges they need to face that are on their laps at the moment. Um, so I wanted to ask this question because I think you, even without realizing, probably are using AI in part of your employee experience. Um, can we go back to the slides, please? It's been said by lots of experts in the last couple of months that we are currently in the golden age uh, of AI. AI is everywhere. So anyone shop on Amazon? Put your hands up if you shop on Amazon. So you've used AI probably in the last couple of days. Anyone watched a film or television program on Netflix in the last week? Then you've used AI. So AI is actually already completely saturated our lives. We're using it every day. Um, so all the experts now agree that actually we are now in this golden age uh, of AI. AI adoption, um, according to Gartner a couple of months ago, is now at 72%. That's double what it was this time last year. So C-suite executives are saying that they've adopted you know, almost uh, AI twice as much as they have in the last 12 months. So the rapid pace in which it's kind of taken over the workplace and influence in the workplace is quite significant. Um, there's even a, a prison in a place called Turku in Finland um, who are now training prisoners on using AI. So they understand that in order for these people to leave prison and live fulfilling lives and get the kind of jobs that they think they should need, they actually believe that AI is what they should be teaching. So they've got kind of iPads and laptops and they're teaching AI to prisoners so that when they leave, they have one of the, the critical skills needed for the workplace. But the problem with AI is that actually there's a bit of this Wizard of Oz thing going on, whereas if you delve beneath lots of AI, um, especially in our industry, it's not actually AI at all. Uh, and estimates put 40% of EU AI startups in, the, uh, in Europe actually aren't AI at all. So 40% of them are AI businesses that don't actually use any AI at all. So there's bits of like chatbots that are completely scripted. So it's not, there's no langu natural language processing. It's not trying to figure out what you're saying. It's already got a stock answer. And that's not real AI in the sense. So there's kind of a lot of smoke and mirrors when it comes to, to AI. <coughs> Uh, next year, AI will generate 2.8 million jobs while replacing 1.8 million. It's pretty common for us to hear from futurologists and experts in this area that 
the robots are going to come and they're going to take over, take over all of our jobs. And actually what we're starting to see is actually it's going to create probably twice as many jobs in the next 10 years than it replaces. And actually what it just starts to do is get rid of lots of the menial tasks. And this is where you'll start to see it reward and benefits. Is it's removing lots of that heavy lifting, the checking through things, and the kind of really data heavy stuff. Um, and we're also starting to see now that AI is improving that employee experience. So you will see this mostly at the moment in kind of hiring and vetting employees. So the process in which people are kind of about to get the job. Now, from my view, I think the employee experience starts as soon as somebody hears about your business. So I was at um, Habas in King's Cross doing a talk uh, a few months ago. And if you've ever been there, Habas Media, great building, really nice uh, experience just being in the building. Um, and I said at one of the talks following that talk that, you know, I think my employee experience with Havas Media started the day I walked into that building to do a talk because I started to get a sense of what it might be like to work here, the kind of people that work here, the kind of business it was. And the chief people officer for Havas Media was in that audience when I said that, so that was kind of good news for her. Um, but I think that's where the employee experience starts. So people are already starting to experience AI as part of their employee experience just by kind of applying for jobs with you. Um, and you might have read in the last couple of weeks, Unilever already estimate they've saved hundreds of thousands of pounds in the last few months for using AI just to kind of go through the vetting and application process. Um, I think one of the biggest applications AI will have on the employee experience is the individual individualization, the personalization that people crave. So in order to kind of personalize as much of that experience as possible, you've kind of got to crunch a huge amount of data to drive people down the route you need them to go. Um, we'll talk a little bit about how that might work with things like benefit selections and personalization. But that means we're getting rid of that kind of cookie cutter experience. We can't replicate the same experience for everybody. The experience every individual employee needs and wants from you has to be individual to them, their needs, their life cycle. And obviously that changes. And so we need AI and we need data to be able to keep up with that because it can make decisions and make choices a lot quicker than we can do uh, as humans. We're also seeing that part of the AI um, at those early stages of a business are starting to identify those employees that are at risk. So PwC do lots of work where their AI machine crunches huge amount of data and will be able to tell you what employees are likely to leave you in the next few months and what you could possibly do about it. And so some of those metrics are things like if somebody moves about 20 miles away from their workplace, they become significantly more likely to leave because that commute just becomes a little bit more unbearable than it was before. So they're using lots of AI to kind of determine that. Some of the big force of PY, uh, EY, PwC um, and others are also looking at how you can identify leaders. So how can you identify leadership quality at that recruitment stage? So when you scan CVs and you look through CVs and they hold some kind of digital interviews with somebody, can you pick out the kind of qualities that an individual might have that could uh, become a leader in the future? Um, and so this is um, research from uh, the last six months. And this is when members of the public were asked about AI and how they think it will impact their life and how they want it to impact their life. And I think if you kind of look at some of the ones in red, so saving time, have easier access to information, be healthier, help with better decision making, have a better work-life balance, uh, help and maintain and develop relationships, you can start to see how, if that's what people want from AI, how easy it is to kind of attribute that to HR reward and benefits. Because obviously having easier access to information, getting people to understand their benefits a lot better is a big challenge at the moment. Uh, the money charity six months ago found that 70% of people still don't understand how pensions work, still don't understand their own pension. So when you look at Theresa May saying auto enrolment's been this great success, 10 million more people enrolled into her pensions, actually the average contributions are still really low and understanding of pensions is still really low. So we've used nudge theory to get people on that retirement journey, but actually we're still leaving them hanging because we're not giving them enough information. So AI, and if you came along to the talk we did in the summer, we talked about how Benefex have kind of got a little chatbot that's trying to get people to understand pensions just through a few questions and answers. Because if you look at how typically benefit providers will talk about something like income protection, and then you see how Money Saving Expert talks about income protection, they're very, very different. We almost assume employees have a certain level of understanding about the benefits that they've got, when actually, I think, generally speaking, people don't have any understanding over what income protection is, how life insurance works. I saw a big study that came out of the US um, about a year or so ago that asked people on the street what they thought income protection was. And people thought it was a benefit you took out when you become ill, not to prevent you from becoming ill. So there's still huge amounts of confusion. So despite the great work of people like Benefex and Thompson's and Mercer and everyone else, we still haven't got to that point where we're taking these really complex uh, financial products and distilling them in a way that people can understand. And AI is really going to help us do that. Um, and people obviously really interested in some of those other things as well, obviously, decision-making, work-life balance. 
<coughs> you might recognise this woman. Uh, she kind of is a woman because she's the first robot to be given residency, so she's a citizen of the United Arab Emirates. Um, this is Sophia, um, a robot that kind of gets wheeled out anytime somebody does a presentation on AI. Uh, she was modelled to look like Audrey Hepburn, so I think uh, Audrey Hepburn's probably rolling in her grave, the idea that she looks like this. Um, and when you think about that candidate experience, most people are getting really nervous as, actually, is, are these robots going to take over? Am I really going to have a good opportunity to sell myself during that recruitment process if I'm face-to-face -face with a robot? Um, but AI isn't going to replace that part. You know, we're very, very far away from somebody being able to have an interview with you through AI. But what it started to do is, as I mentioned before, remove some of that heavy lifting. So the idea that if you get hundreds of CVs, it can do the first scan on those. It can start to look for keywords or specific education or experience. So it's not replacing that actually conversation, it's just augmenting it. Um, and we're seeing AI used as well as part of the employee experience to just ask a few questions about um, that candidate before you bring them in. So actually, for those of you that have done any kind of recruitment where you might have <coughs> hundreds and hundreds of candidates, you're now able to just filter that down so the people you meet face to face have already gone through uh, a few processes which have been completely automated and you haven't had to do any work with. Uh, as recruitment requires nurturing relationships. Anyone who's worked in recruitment knows that actually that kind of face-to-face -face and building that bond with employees needs to happen. So it, like I say, we're a very, very long way, way from that happening where we're replacing that face-to-face -face work. <coughs> There's lots of famous robots throughout this. If you've ever gone through stock image search for AI, you'll see like robot fingers typing on a computer and things like that, which is, if you were a computer, why would you type? You just naturally let the numbers appear and the letters appear, right? But, so I've just put famous robots throughout this whole presentation. Um, I think one of the, um, one of the areas of the uh, employee experience that um, my book really centered on was well-being, and it's the role I do now. It's, you know, I spend every day speaking with companies all around the world about how do they develop you know, really positive and impactful well-being. And I think where AI is going to have a really big impact is in how we manage well-being. So we're already seeing that it's helping people with decision-making. So when people need to make decisions about their health and their well-being, um, it's starting to have an impact on that. So as I mentioned, it can take complex things like private medical and start to distill that down so you can start to understand use cases and understand why that benefit might be good for you. Um, it's helping a lot in early detection. So um, if you look at dermatologists, they can accurately identify skin cancer in about 87% of the times. When you look at how AI is doing that, it's 95%. And there's some great work being done in places like uh, Copenhagen and Denmark where they have an AI tool that's listening in on emergency service calls and is able to quickly identify the symptom of the person and whether they're likely to have cardiac arrest about 15 seconds faster than a human can. And so all of a sudden we're starting to see that early detection when it comes to kind of well-being is really, really critical when it comes to AI. Um, in financial well-being as well, you've also got some people out there um, selling some financial well-being products that do this kind of stuff, but we're starting to see that it's identifying savings opportunities. So we see this with some of the challenger banks and some of the major banks now where you're able to look at your spending and start to identify that you're probably spending too much on Starbucks, buying the uh, eggnog latte or whatever it might be. Um, but it's also helped with objective decision making. So part of the thing with well-being is we don't act rationally as humans. So the idea that we make rational decisions is complete nonsense. We act emotive. Uh, you look at the Nobel Prize winner, Richard Thaler, when he talks about how people don't make decisions rationally, he used the Brexit vote. Do I get a point for mentioning Brexit? Is that the first time today? Um, it'll all be over on the 13th of December, don't worry about it. Um, and he was saying about the Brexit vote, it's a really good example of how people actually ignored manifestos on both sides. They didn't read the facts. It's just a very emotive decision that people made. And there's a great video of him talking about this on YouTube. And, um, and so when it comes to objective decision making, we're at that point where, um, especially when it comes to um, making financial decisions, we come up with the idea of, um, oh, it's only five pounds, it won't matter, that kind of thing. We have that attitude to money where, oh, it doesn't matter if I just take 50 pounds out of my savings, it's not going to have a big impact. <coughs> but the machines don't have that emotive na nature to them. So they know that, well, taking that 50 pounds out is going to affect your savings in five years by 250 pounds, whatever it might be. So it can make some better decisions because it acts a little bit more rationally than we do as humans. So, with all that in mind, I'll be interested to know whether you think this is all bullshit or not. Um, which of the following areas of the employee experience do you think AI will have the biggest impact on? I feel like I might have pushed you down a certain route with this.
one person's voted and they didn't choose anything. You have to take my word for it now. I could just lie and say you've all agreed with what I'm saying. Uh, so recruitment seems to be the biggest. So 29, 30% of people recruitment. So this is frozen as well, sorry. I think it was recruitment and reward recognition were the two top ones, I think. We'll share those, we'll share those with you later on. So I guess it's, we're, that kind of ruins the next slide if I don't know what you're thinking. But um, just by a show of hands then, who kind of thinks it's recruitment? Okay, quite a few of you. Reward and recognition. Uh, learning and development. Oh, there you go. Employee benefits. Reward recognition. Okay, interesting. Yeah, so I, I, would, I would agree with that. So I think well-being is obviously where it's going to have the biggest impact. Recruitment's kind of where AI already is. Um, so that's where lots of investment's going. So that's quite interesting. Sorry, Maggie, can you take a picture of that for me as well? Thank you. <coughs> so part of the problem with AI at the moment is that we have this thing called tech creep. So... Um, you know, as I mentioned earlier on, um, people told me kind of six months ago that the, some of this stuff was too progressive, and I'm now telling you that it's already in your lives. And so what we started to see is that people are getting really nervous about AIs just naturally appearing in your lives, kind of saturating your lives, and you don't really have any choice over that. So it's kind of dominating the consumer's lives, um, and that makes people really, really nervous, and it's kind of sneaking up on us. And so as a result, 60% of the public are opposed to the use of automated decision-making in recruitment as well as criminal justice. So if you think about that in the context of what you've just said and what I've just said, that actually that's where it's having the biggest impact, it's where people are really, really nervous about it. And lots of that is because we've never really told the, the public about what AI is. You know, there's this magic element of AI where it just happens and nobody really understands how it works. Uh, and I'll come back to that. And so when you ask people how comfortable are they with AI, 55% of people who use AI only say they're comfortable. So you've only got about half the people who are actively using AI who believe that it's a, it's a comfortable experience. Um, but when you ask them, do you think you'd be able to more open to using AI if it helped you in your daily life, for example, saving time or money, all of a sudden those figures go up. So as soon as people can see what's in it for them, they start to understand that actually there's a benefit to this stuff. Um, and so that's where it gets really interesting. We'll come back to that uh, in a moment. But one of the biggest problems we have in AI at the moment, and, it's, and we'll talk about how it's creeping into reward and benefits already, is you probably, when you hear about AI, and you hear about AI in the news, you hear all these negative stories about the fact that actually machines are pretty biased at the moment. Um, Chief Justice John Roberts, um, the, um, the Chief Justice for the US, was asked at an event recently, can you foresee a day when smart machines driven with artificial intelligence will assist in courtroom fact-finding or more controversially, even judicial decision-making. And his response was that it's a day that's already here. So this is happening a lot in the US. It's also happening in the UK with the Home Office. That AI is being used to assess whether people re-offend or not, and the likelihood of them re-offending. And it's having pretty serious ramifications on the justice system. Um, my dad is a prison officer for kind of 40 years, so when I kind of went through these slides with him and told him this stuff, he was pretty, uh, he was pretty appalled at it, because obviously in the prison service, they stopped governors allowing people... Uh, allowing them to extend the sentences of, uh, of prisoners. So if a prisoner kind of did something naughty in prison, they could extend that sentence. And actually, this country felt like that should be done by a judge, that shouldn't be done by uh, a governor. So they took those powers away, and now everyone has to see a judge if they want to extend somebody's uh, sentence for fighting or whatever it might be. Um, but there's a, a, a piece of technology, AI technology, being used in the US called Compass. And that assesses the likelihood of somebody who's about to come up for parole of committing a similar offence or another offence in the future. Um, and as you can imagine, like with all AI, it's incredibly racially biased. So what they started to find in the US is they've done about 100 different studies on the results of, of Compass. And it's been used widely across most states in the US. They found that it's actually racially biased against black people. So it basically finds that 
if you are a black person in the system, it will automatically assume that you're more likely to reoffend. And that's having big, big problems, and there's a couple of uh, big cases going through the courts at the moment. Um, and what the individual studies have started to look at, the impact of that, is what they found is you could stop somebody on the street, give them the background of that offender, and they would be more accurate at being able to tell you whether that person was likely to reoffend or not than the machine compass, which has been used in so many states across the US. So there's a big problem with bias um, in AI. Um, and this lady, whose net surname I will not attempt to pronounce, has started looking at facial recognition. And what she found is that AI at the moment can identify gender with a 99% accuracy. So it can look at a photograph and automatically determine within milliseconds whether that person is male or female. But only if you're a white man. If you are a black woman, it go, the accuracy goes down to about 30%. So again, big problem with black faces. And you've seen this with loads of different things, like lots of facial recognition. You've probably heard the stories about uh, the Amazon's recruitment bias, where they had this big story where actually it became really biased against women in the recruitment process. And that's because the training data it was using suggested that if you would get to a senior management position, historically, you were a man. So if you started including words in your CV like, I'm part of the women's hockey club, it wouldn't attribute that to any of the qualities of the men that had given positions to in the past. So all of a sudden, the data that came from humans that had human fingerprints on it becomes completely useless because that old training data, which is used for lots of AI, actually is just going to predict the biases of the people that created these things in the first place. <coughs> There's a great story of how this works for Facebook. Um, two years ago, an Israeli man was arrested uh, in his home because he posted a photograph of himself uh, next to a bulldozer uh, with the words, attack them, written next to it. So the Israeli police stormed his house, arrested him, and questioned him for hours and hours. And then what they realized is actually, attack them in Hebrew is actually very similar to good morning. So when he uploaded the photograph of him leaning on this bulldozer with the words good morning, Facebook's algorithm kind of translated that um, into the wrong language, uh, or into the wrong translation. And so this guy spent something like eight hours in custody because Facebook made a mistake with the way that they translate data. Um, and that's quite significant, right? I think. When you think about people's trust in this kind of stuff, these, th these are the kind of stories people hear. So as you see that tech creep coming in, we're not hearing the good stories about how AI is helping people. We're generally hearing some of those bad stories. Um, I met a company recently, a Welsh company, that has developed a piece of technology that can read through people's medical records in seconds. And they were called to the US for a little boy in California who had been in and out of hospital all his life. He was only six years old. Um, and he'd gone to prison, uh, gone to prison, gone to, uh, um, gone to hospital with, um, got to the hospital with uh, breathing problems and they couldn't work out what was wrong with him so they kept doing all these tests and they were running out of time and they realized that then this condition was getting worse and worse so they gave electronically the medical records of this boy which went into thousands and thousands of pages because he'd had a complicated medical history to this company in wales and what they were able to do is filter through all of his records in nine hours so they basically imported them into the system it took nine hours which is quite a long time but it would have taken 90 days for a human to do the same work and was able to identify certain symptoms and keywords within the medical records that gave them a diagnosis. And it was the correct diagnosis, and he was able to get the care he needed within 24 hours and left hospital. And actually, they started dawning on them that actually if this was left to a human, that 90 days would have been too long to go through all those records, and that kid would have died. So there's some really good stories about how this stuff is helping as well. But what we're starting to see is this is happening in HR. So a guy called um, Ibrahim Dalio in the US arrived at work one day um, late last year to find that his security pass didn't work. When he eventually got into the building, he was escorted off the premises by security without even getting to meet his team. What he later found out was that uh, an email had been sent from an automated email had gone to the security team to say this person has left the business, revoked their access. He was then contacted by recruiters because their recru recruiters were notified this person no longer works with us. And they only found out this all happened because they moved HR systems and he was left off. So the system recognized him as no longer an employee so it instigated all these different rules that meant his security pass was deactivated, his access to systems went, and he didn't find all this stuff out until a few days later at being home trying to work out what had happened. So we're starting to see that have a really negative impact on the employee experience as well. <coughs> Excuse me. So how do we remove that AI bias uh, in HR reward? So as we start to see AI creep into reward and benefits in particular, most providers will start to look at the historic data that they've got. And so a great example is something like income protection. So if you go to most of the providers in this market and you look at the data around income protection, 
you'll generally see that it's of most interest to somebody who's a bit older or has children. And when we start to look at that data, we kind of realise that, well, it's of most interest to those people because they're the people historically we've marketed that benefit at. So we've started to see high take-up of those benefits because we've pushed it towards those individual employees. But if you look at some of the most recent research, it's actually a really valued benefit for younger people because younger people are more conscious, those under the age of 30, are more conscious of um, their chances of getting a mental health condition, their chances of getting cancer. So, you know, one in three of us will have a mental health condition in a lifetime. Uh, one in two of us will have cancer in our lifetimes. So these are really real threats that young people are kind of really um, attuned to. And so income protection is a benefit we see young people really, really wanting to, to buy. Now, there's obviously some challenges with the cost of that for, some, for certain people. But actually, if we looked at the historic data, we put that into an AI machine that recommended benefits to employees, it would continue to recommend benefits to the profile of the employees that we've always targeted at. So that leaves us with a situation where we almost have to either ignore that data or really go through that data and start to work out how are we targeting these benefits to individual employees? What is the system doing? How is it interpreting historic data? <coughs> we also need to diversify our HR and reward teams. It sounds pretty obvious, but you know, if I look around the room now, we've only got male, female, but there's not a lot of ever diversity that I can see. Obviously, there's ever diversity that you can't see. Um, so when we start looking at that data, we need those people who are diverse in those HR and reward teams to be able to tell us that actually this data isn't reflective of our, our workforce. So it's really important that we start to make sure that the people responsible for AI within our business are diverse and that we have people around them that are diverse as well so they can start to call out that data. And if you look at lots of the people that have called out bias in AI and the researchers that have been paying attention to this, it's the people in the minorities that realise that they're being a bit screwed over by AI that are doing the research to kind of expose this bias. And we also need to continue to think about the end user. So when you apply design thinking to the employer experience, you kind of should be doing this anyway. But always thinking about we're designing for that individual employee. And it becomes a really good mind frame to kind of get yourselves into this design thinking when you apply AI to any part of the workforce. And that's whether you're doing something yourself or whether you're just buying a product. There are things you can do to make sure that you're solving the right problems with AI. And that's quite a big thing. It's easy to point AI at the wrong problem and get a different solution. Um, and something I don't see talked about quite a lot is um, data privacy in AI. AI requires data. It requires lots of personal data to make the decisions and the recommendations and the decisions that it needs to. Um, and there's an AI uh, specialist, head of AI at PwC, who I asked this question to, and they didn't have an answer. So I felt pretty smart that I'd asked the question. Um, and that is, how does GDPR affect AI? So I'm not going to bore you with GDPR, because we've kind of had enough of that over the last 12 months. But just before I get onto that, when you ask people about their personal data, the attitudes, unsurprisingly, have completely changed. So 94% of people agree that data security is critical for AI, but 73% of consumers say their concerns over data are increasing. Clearly, we've seen everything that's happened with Facebook and Cambridge Analytica. We can see our data being misused. We have organizations, startups that are starting in the US that are trying to get us to commoditize and realize the value of our own data. So there's a company in the US that is trying to get people to add a value to their data. So understanding that your political choices, your preferences over products, your age, your demographics is really, really valuable to people. So we need to start putting a price on that so that actually we don't just give that up to anybody. We only give it up when we know we're going to get something of equal value in return. And I was speaking to a company the other day who um, they send out kind of um, these like delivery subscription boxes of different kind of protein bars and stuff like that in the US. So you can sign up to a subscription box and you'll get like a month's worth of protein bars and milkshakes and all that kind of stuff. Um, and they used to charge for that. And now they started to realize that the people who make these bars want their bars to go in the boxes because they can start to realize what people's preferences are. So in the US, they can start to realize that when their employees give them that, or then the users give them their feedback, a caramel bar is of real preference to people who live in Texas. Yeah, a chocolate bar is of real preference to people who work in California. And that data is so important to them that they're now giving these boxes away. So they're giving subscription boxes away. You just pay for postage because the feedback of whether you like the products or not becomes so valuable to them that it's not even worth charging you for the stuff because getting your feedback is worth more than them just giving you the product. And so that's how important our data is uh, becoming. And it's the reason why we should all be really conscious of how it's used. And so it's kind of no surprise that consumers and employees are really nervous about how we're going to use that data. But if we can <coughs> convince them we're doing that in a secure and sensible way, 
and there's a trade-off which you know you're, we're going to enable you to make decisions quicker we're going to get you better prices we're going to get you more tailored benefits or more personalized experience that's a decent trade-off but if you look at gdpr so the seven basic principles of gdpr i won't go into all, to, uh, all of them but i just want to highlight one and that's transparency the Brookings Institute in the US has said that GDPR places severe restrictions on the use of artificial intelligence and machine learning. People who are doing AI in the US at the moment are glad that they don't have GDPR. And that should be a concern of us because we want AI, but we've also got GDPR. And the problem with transparency is that there is a black box nature to AI. So it makes decisions that we don't really know it's making and we don't know why it's making those decisions. We put all the data in and it just kicks out some of the decisions and recommendations. And this is a black box, by the way. This is a flight recorder black box, which isn't black, clearly. But, um, so when you look at the legislation around GDPR, within the transparency clause, you have to be able to tell employees um, the meaning and information and the logic involved. So basically, you need to explain that if it's recommended a benefit, if you've not made it through the recruitment process, if it's made this decision around your well-being, you need to be able to tell your employees under GDPR how it came to that decision. But that black box nature of AI is most people can't tell you why it makes the decisions it does. And we've got a really good example that's happened in the last couple of weeks with the Apple Card. So the Apple Card has rolled out to the US. Um, and one kind of social media influencer started to realize that he applied for the card and his wife applied for the card. And actually, she got a lower credit rating than he did. And so when they looked through their um, employment history, their kind of salaries, their earnings, they started to realize they were very similar. So this guy tweeted that he thought that the algorithm that uh, Apple Card was using was biased against women. And Steve Wozniak, one of the founders of Apple, chipped in, and he started to realize as well, and lots of people started coming in and saying, guys, I think we've got a problem with gender bias in how the Apple Card is either approving people or what credit limit it's given them. And it was biased against women. And so within about 24 hours, uh, the US Federation kind of got involved and started to investigate, and that investigation is still continuing. But when asked for a, a response, Apple couldn't give a response because they don't know how it's making those decisions. So they've conjectured things like if you um, bought from a shop, um, if, a, if, a, if somebody bought clothes from a shop, for example, um, and people typically who buy from that shop are in their overdraft or have lots of money on credit cards, then it might take that into account. Now, if that's a women's shop, that's going to have bias against women immediately uh, rather than men. So what they started to investigate now is exactly why that's happening. But we're weeks later, four weeks later, and Apple still haven't been able to produce any meaningful answers as to why it's making the decisions it, it is. Uh, and that's a big, big problem for us, I think. And so when that comes to reward and benefits in particular, I think where we're going to start to see is how do we get the right benefits to people. So as I mentioned before, some of these benefits are really complicated. People don't understand some of this stuff. But if we can tailor some of those to the experience of the employees going through, so the life cycle that they're in, the challenges they're facing at that stage in their life, that's where it gets really interesting for us because we're specifically targeting and personalizing that reward and benefits experience. Amazon do this really well. So if you went onto Amazon, I don't know, search for my book, for example, <coughs> $7.99, free delivery on Prime, um, you would start to get some recommendations of people who bought this also bought these other not as good books. Um, so you'll start to see things like what you've searched for, what you've put in your basket, what you've put in your basket that you never even bought but sat in your basket for a period of time. And it starts to make some choices around recommending products and services. And when you start looking at how much money Amazon make, and obviously we know they make a hell of a lot of money, 35% um, of their revenue now comes through just their recommendations alone. So a third of all the sales that come through Amazon are the recommendations they make based on what you've bought. And those recommendations go significantly higher when they follow up with an email. So when they send you an email saying, you bought this, you might be interested in this, that's where they actually see most of the magic happen, not actually on the site. So you think about it in the context of reward and benefits, when we start to um, tailor some of those experiences to people, when we start to recommend benefits, you can start to actually show benefits that people like you choose and that kind of stuff. So I think that's quite significant. <coughs> what we're also starting to see as well is the emergence of um, voice interaction. So typically kind of search interaction was where most things kind of have, um, sat in the past. But voice interaction is becoming pretty significant. So one in 25 household people in the UK have a smart speaker in their household. How many people here have got one? Keep your hand up if you've got more than one. It's about 50% of people who've got one smart speaker have got at least one other. So the adoption is really, really high. And obviously Amazon's Black Friday deals and that kind of stuff are pushing that further and further. You know, 
you can get one, I think, tomorrow for, for £20, which is obviously a really big saving. Um, but that voice is now expected over the next 10 years to take over mobile as our primary source of getting to things. And people like Amazon are looking at how can they push notifications to you? So can they take some of those recommendations and speak them to you whilst you're sat at home watching television? I don't know how they're going to do that because that sounds like it's going to get really annoying. You're in the middle of watching television it recommends Geffen's book, for example. Um, and if you start to see how smart speakers are being used, obviously the home is kind of the place where most of them are. Um, Alexa is now integrated into cars, it's integrated into televisions, it's integrated natively into some phones. You have Cortana with uh, Windows phones, you have Siri with Apple phones. Um, the Wynn Casino in Las Vegas um, has bought one smart speaker for every one of its 4,500 hotel rooms. And so that adoption is getting really, really significant. We're starting to see them used at drive throughs So when you go through a drive through you go to McDonald's drive through and you order, you'll no longer speak to a person. It will just record the order that you've spoken. It will probably have a conversation with you, and then your order will be delivered to the window. So the adoption of kind of voice control is becoming really, really significant. <coughs> Over the last couple of weeks, um, Cortana has now been integrated into Outlook for Microsoft. So you can now ask Cortana to read your emails to you. So what it will do is prioritize the people that it knows you read emails from most or that you've listed as a VIP. And so again, that's quite significant. And before it tells you, it will tell you how long it's going to take to read those emails out. So if you ask Outlook now to read the emails to you, it will tell you your VIP emails will take five minutes. And you can decide whether you just want to listen to that while you're driving and hear those. So again, quite significant. People like Microsoft and IBM are doing lots around voice search and voice control. And within employee experience context, that's quite significant as well. So you can start to see that actually booking meeting rooms could be really easy if you could just say, find me a room for five people at 12 p.m. on the 13th. And it will just do that for you. At Benefex, it's, it's a nightmare. We've got automatically all controlled rooms, but it's still a nightmare to try and find a meeting room. Uh, notifications and company news. So actually announcing news to people, giving them alerts, telling them that they need to do certain things. Uh, checking schedules, running reports, automate the skills answering HR questions, and benefit queries. So could you get to a point where, if we're saying things like income protects are quite difficult to understand, and people are getting lazier, our attention spans have dropped by 12, 12 seconds in the last 10 years, what if I could just ask my speaker, what is income protection, or how does it work, or why do I need it, or why should I have it? And what we talked about in the summer was how we're using AI to change employee benefits. So specifically, we're using a chatbot to try and get people to the decisions and the products that they need to make as quickly as possible because we know people have got no patience. Take something like dental insurance, for example. On any provider's website, if you read all the words that the major dental provider wants you to read, it's about 4,000 words, which is about 25 minutes worth of reading. If you offer 10 or 15 benefits, you're expecting somebody to read for about two to three hours, and clearly they're not going to do. People just aren't going to spend attention doing that stuff. And so that apathy, because it's so difficult, means that people just don't do it in the way that we want them to. But all of a sudden, the two-way conversation of asking questions and getting responses becomes really interesting. <coughs> and it's really easy to take something like a chatbot and make that voice controlled. So I had to play around with some of the, the product development stuff we've been doing. This is my smart speaker at home. That should work. Alexa, increase my pension contributions by 50 pounds a month. Okay, I'll do that. Your new employee contributions will be £350 per month, starting on the 1st of January. You'll need to log into the OneHub app to authenticate. So what you start to see, if anyone um, uses Barclays as an app, so Barclays have integrated Siri into their mobile banking app. So I can now say, pay my friend John £10, and it does that, and it asks me to authenticate using Face ID, but I don't have to log into the app. I don't have to go in and choose the account it wants to come from. It's got some default set. And so that becomes a really, really nice consumer experience. And so as people see more of that experience outside of work, they're going to want to see more of it inside of work. And some of the privacy stuff is kind of covered. So you could kind of ask a chatbot or you could ask uh, your phone a question about your benefits, but the response could come in text form. So you then just get an alert with the response. So the, the speaker isn't announcing that alert out to everyone. Um, and I think some of that is quite significant. The impact that could have on our uh, reward and benefits experience is quite significant. So, Jerry Springer, final thoughts from me. Um, point AI technology at the right problem, or the right solution, sorry. So, if you point AI at your recruitment solution, for example, that's, at the moment, not going to help your diversity problem. So, it's, you need to really think about the impact that some of these things are going to have. 
choosing vendors that understand algorithmic bias. So most AI now has the ability to be able to ignore sex and gender and age. Um, so if we, get, if we get machines to do that and choose vendors that make sure they can actually um, not account for some of that discrimination, we actually get something more interesting in the data. Um, simple stuff, ask yourself, would it be considered fair if people found out how you're using the data or technology? Plan to ensure fairness and accuracy, and that needs to become by owning, uh, assigning ownership. So what we see in with AI at the moment, and it has problems, is very few people want to own it. And you'll see this with the whole Apple problem. There's very few people who want to kind of put their hands up and say, I was responsible for making sure this data was, was accurate and the responses it gave were true. Um, and as I mentioned before, build diverse teams. If we're going can to cancel out any of these diverse, uh, diversity problems with AI, we need the people that are feeding the data into the systems to be as diverse as the people that we're working with. Hopefully that gives you something to think about. Um, thank you very much.